Hello, I'm Jerry David Mulligan, and this is Mulligan Stew Podcast, music, film, food, and wine. Trust me, I thought a lot about doing a food show and a wine show, but those are coming. This is a music show specifically about Tarek. I discovered Tarek when he was a solo artist in Alberta, and many of you know him from that time. He then accepted a position with the Canadian indie music network, CBC Radio 3. He was a member of a Vancouver band called Brastronaut, who found a wonderful fan base. He's also a writer. By the way, in the magazine The Walrus, you'll find an article called How to Make a Hit Song in 2018, in which Tarek explores whether the chorus might be dead in today's songwriting. One of the things we're going to talk about with Tarek is his day job. He is a lecturer at the University of British Columbia on songwriting, lyrics specifically. Fascinating that he can be a singer-songwriter and pass on what he knows to students who think they might like to become singer-songwriters. Tarek has released a new full-length record, Telegrams, on Tonic Records, and it shouldn't come as a surprise that the songs feel like short stories because he's a fan of short fiction. He also found inspiration with American fiction writer Laurie Moore and the late Chilean author Roberto Balano, and he cast them as leads in his songs. There's lots to talk about here. Tarek. I have this note in front of me that says Tarek's return to Alberta is coming in May to Edmonton and Calgary. And mm-hmm. and for the life of me, for the life of me, I, I had lost track of you. I, I knew yeah. that, I, I didn't know where you were broadcasting from when you were with CBC. Yeah. But, but it didn't surprise me in the least that you were in Vancouver because it, it could be a bit of a draw, especially if you if there were things that would draw you here creatively. Um, yeah. w- when did you, you, you left you, Calgary in what, 20, uh, 2006? 2006. That's right. Yeah, exactly. As, I worked, um, I worked at, uh, CBC at radio three for a little bit, but, hosting, uh, hosting, but that show, in other words, I mean, you can do radio as you know, from anywhere, especially cause you have studi- yeah. studios in Calgary, but the sh- they wanted that show to come from Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, every all the hosts were there, and it was kind of a kind of a big thing that was just brewing in uh, in Vancouver. So, and I was kind of looking for a, an opportunity for a change. I mean, I uh, I had lived in Calgary for ten years and loved that place, and have so many good friends there and so forth. But you know, I I kind of wanted to change. So when that opportunity came, I was I was you know just fine with uh, moving out to the West Coast. Did you have to put your music uh, career I mean, your songwriting off to the side in order to concentrate on that yeah that's a good question a little bit i mean it was a full-time job i sort of absorbed music and thought about music in a different way because i i was i mean i feel, I feel like it was a kind of an education period of music you had to listen to so much stuff uh so much material that was coming in and i uh, i i just became aware of of um, a lot of different artists that I hadn't heard of before through that job. So in a way, it was it was good because it was a music education, but it did kind of hamper my writing time for sure. I didn't have as much time as I uh, had had previously to work on on songs and material. So you know, it was a bit of a give and take there. I had to try and work a little bit harder to to make those moments happen. And then and then, if, and then of course you were doing interviews asking about songwriting of other people. That's right, exactly. <laughs> and you learn a lot of stuff that way, you know, talking to other artists about songwriting. So that's that's pretty interesting. And I did meet some some uh, some, some folks that I you know really respected their work. And um, I remember having a, a great interview with uh, Nico Case and recording some songs with her in studio. You know, we set up the session and did that, and hear about her process and so forth. So some of that stuff is was uh, was really interesting. Ah, who am I? Who am I thinking of? The uh, the Texas uh, singer songwriter um, uh, was married to Julia Roberts. Oh, Lyle Lovett. Okay, so Lyle Lovett. I'm doing an interview in the lobby of the um, uh, Queen Elizabeth Theater, and Lyle uh, comes out after sound check, and 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 uh, uh, he. I said, "How did you?" How did this all, was there one thing that set this in motion? He said, I was at the University of Texas and I wanted to learn how to be a songwriter. So I started a radio show about songwriting. 
<laughs> and I interviewed all of the Texas songwriters, all of my heroes. And then I went to school. Literally, I recorded it. I ran the series and all of that. And then I studied each and every syllable that they told me. And that's how I learned to write songs. That's amazing. I love it. <laughs> yeah, great way to great way to look at that kind of a job, right? As, a, as purely pure education, get everything that you want from all your uh, from all the from all your heroes. When you finished your radio gig, were you mm-hmm. had you changed your thoughts about songwriting and singing and music? I think so. Um, I mean, uh just watching what other people do, different ways that people write songs. You know, I've always been kind of someone who writes on a guitar and kitchen kind of thing. And I don't think that will ever completely go away. That's just, you know, a comfortable place for me to write songs. But it was interesting to see that there are other ways to do it. Um, You know, whether it's, you you know, starting with some wacky drum machine line or, uh, or, um, you know, going for a bike ride and just singing bunch of melodies without thinking too hard about it or you know i mean everyone has their kind of different different ways so i think i definitely incorporated some of those ideas into what i was doing and just hearing i think one of the things i like doing too is because i had to listen to so much music uh we had like music committees you know we'd listen to music and see what got added to the station so i'd i'd go on these walks and and just like you know strap on the headphones and and really listen to a whole album through and and I would I become very analytical about the songs. I become very analytical about the structure of the songs, and I became really interested in in song structure, like you know how to how to make things interesting or how to keep things surprising, um, adding an extra bar or, or uh, subtracting in a bar from a certain part of the song, which kind of keeps your ear tweaked. Like what just happened there. Um, some of those kind of real musical elements, I think I started to pay more attention to, uh, lyrics I've always paid attention to, but maybe I was starting to pay a little bit more attention to some of the musical, uh, I, you know, I don't want to say tricks, but sort of tricks, I guess, or things that you can do, strategies that you can do to, to make something interesting to the ear. Uh, and like I say, just listening to song structures. So that I think really, really changed. I'd walk around and I'd actually like count bars and be like, what? two, three, four. Oh, there's something, something weird happened there, you know? And I still do that now. And I think that was something I developed through, uh, through my period there working at the CBC and just having to listen to a lot of music. It's been a while since we've had new music and we want to celebrate that. Um, by the way, there are two videos out you want to have a look for, uh, Coco Hala and Walking Dead, a very different one from the other. Um, <laughs> Uh, I drove that Coco Hala Road uh, many, many, many times when we lived uh, in, in Naramata. Um, avoided it in the wintertime. It was a nasty high, but it, but it's a metaphor for you. Uh, and the, and the Walking Dead is <laughs> you want to you riding around on a skateboard all day. It's very cool. There's no walking involved. It's all you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Exactly. Um, so let me, let's just do, do, talk about that. that Coco Hala. Mm. Um, I, I presume of course, and I, I, and I do this all the time that, that the songwriter is not writing about him or herself. Um, it could be somebody completely different. And some, some songwriters just literally, uh, walk around with an aerial fully up listening to conversations around them until they hear a character take over their, their soul. So, so um, uh, and, and you, I know you read a lot and you uh, uh, spend time uh, searching out uh, how these songs come to you. Uh, was, uh, am I correct in my assumption that this mm-hmm. is someone else's story that you've be taken over? Yeah. I, I mean, that was another thing that I thought about during that period of, uh, being a radio host was just this idea, as you mentioned, about not writing autobiographically, you know, um, and, and and it suddenly opens up a whole other world of uh, possibilities because your own life can get pretty narrow at some point and pretty boring to write about. So now if you can treat it like a, a, an exercise in fiction, um, suddenly you've got a lot of stories available. So I, in fact, took um, actual stories. I, I, I I, I do love short fiction. I love short stories. And I was reading some short stories. And one day I just sat down. I think the one I read was a Roberto Bolaño story called Clara. 
and I read that story in the New Yorker one night and just uh, start, you know, pick up a guitar after I read the story because I was just so moved by the piece and and uh, started strumming something and and I don't know this I would started singing that story, you know, um, and then uh, I changed, you know, I wasn't like a word for word using the paragraphs of the actual story but kind of the idea of this love affair that didn't go very well between the narrator and a woman named Clara and um, that became the song and I thought this is this is actually kind of a fun exercise uh, maybe I should try that again and I listened you know I, the next time we read another short story that I was moved by and tried tried doing that again and Coca Hollow was uh, um, was one of those songs and and it didn't have anything to do really with Coca Hollow, but it did have to do with um, uh, a, a driving down a highway and a, again a sort of love story. I guess I'm drawn to the love stories uh, of the love stories that don't work out, and this one was a, 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 about a rancher who fell in love with a uh, a woman who was a night school teacher slash lawyer, and he drives down the highway at one point towards the end of the story to try and find her because he feels like she's kind of lost to him. So I modified and made my own version and introduced the Coca-Cola Highway into my song, which in the actual story by the American author Miley Malloy, um, it's, uh, you know, it's some interstate highway somewhere in the States, but, uh, yeah, I, I did draw from, uh, from that story to, uh, to create my own. I'm going to play this. And especially if you're listening on a podcast, um, I, I hope you're on the Coca-Cola highway as you hear Coca-Cola. This is Tarek from Telegrams. Started with a buzzing feeling It turned into a ringing sound So I fired up the headbolt heater And headed on into town There was snow burning up in the headlights And a cross on the side of the hill Looked as cold as a steel in my right leg But I keep beneath the windowsill I still get letters from some friends in the army Forwarded from my last address Sometimes when I'm out feeding the horses I feel something rising up in my chest And I could drive through the night to see you I could fly to England to friends Or just slow down to some passing
His name is Tarek. The album is Telegrams. Um, I want. I don't want to misrepresent what it is that you do as a day job, uh, but I understand that you teach university level courses in lyric writing as a lecturer at UBC. Is it just lyrics or is it songwriting? I guess um, kind of both. Yeah. I mean, we study existing lyrics and we also, you know, give students an opportunity to, um, to write their own songs as well. So uh, a bit of, a bit of uh, analysis and a bit of practical work as well. But uh, yeah, I do that at UBC. That's right. Absolutely. I did my uh, MFA uh, at UBC uh, in 20 graduated in 2014. So I do have uh, my, my MFA as well. Is it challenging to te- to teach the courses? Yep. Um, I mean, it could become routine. It could become, you know, uh-huh. uh, a, a Tuesday. Um, yeah. uh, but I mean, your, your audience should be uh, totally engaged and probably challenging you to uh, uh, e- explain what it is you're saying. Yeah. I think in, in a way it's a bit like what we were talking about before, you know, again, with the whole, doing something like talking on the radio or doing interviews as being an education in songwriting. This, this can also be an education in songwriting, even, even though it would seem on the outside that I'm the one, you know, saying things or talking about stuff. But I still, as you, as you're sort of inferring there, I think is that I still have to read about stuff, right? I have to be uh, a kind of aware about how I'm going to talk about something. So that does again, force me into like, Hmm, you know, read some articles about um, point of view. How to use point of view in songs? Maybe I might start keeping a keen ear about how certain artists use point of view in song. You know, they visit first person or third person or whatever, and and then uh, I'm just more aware of that and tapping into it. Or maybe when I'm listening, I'm listening for examples of that. And and, and so again, you know, it kind of makes you more aware, keeps your awareness sharp. Um, because you know, in a way that you've got that gives you some fodder of things to go and talk about when you uh, when you teach your class. So, and you know, and I certainly uh, learn things from uh, from students as well. I mean, there's some, some aspiring songwriters who are doing some really good work too. So, they uh, you know they always impress me with their creativity. So you can learn that way as well. Um, how long have you been teaching the course? I graduated in 2014, um, so a few years now. I, I, I started teaching just the one songwriting course in and around that time, 2014, 2015, and then sort of evolved. I teach a, a, a couple of them to a, a, a few different levels now. I, I sort of only taught an intermediate one at, at a certain point. Now I teach um, uh, one for an older, uh, not older, but more advanced um, MFA class in addition to the intermediate level. Uh, and, last, and last question, have you kept an eye on your graduates? Have you watched uh, where they went? To see what they've done afterwards? Yeah, yeah. Um, some, yeah, I do. I, it, sometimes they drop me lines and uh, and get in touch and, and uh, tell me about stuff. I actually had a uh, one of them who graduated, and he was actually a really strong songwriter, quite good. And I wasn't surprised that he went off and like continued to work on it and uh, set up a band camp page. And he did email me at some time in the summer. I think it was either last, I think it was last summer, in fact. And he said, oh, hey, you know, I just wanted to ask you some questions about, um, you know, where where can I go from, go with this from there? And I said, oh, yeah, okay, well, tell me what you're doing. And, you know, I looked at these band camp links and I was like, hey, he's getting pretty serious about mm. this. So, you know, <laughs> it's actually, it was actually really good to see. Uh, I wonder uh, uh, finally about um, about songwriting. If people understand how difficult it can be, mm-hmm. how when the paper's blank mm-hmm. and there's nothing moving you to, to pick up pen, paper, or a type, yeah. uh, you know, a keyboard, it's it's unbelievable how uh, uh, the world can, the walls can close in on you if, yeah. if if you have nothing to say or it won't come to you. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, I was thinking about this just not for not long ago in fact because you know i finished this record that we've been talking about but in a way you know from a practical stance you have to kind of already start thinking about the next one in a way right you know if you don't start thinking about it then a bunch of years can go by before you start thinking about it and you you lose a little bit of momentum so i'm like okay i gotta write some more songs what where do you where do you start it's almost a bit of a daunting process of like um, getting going again and 
And uh, and you do wonder, you think, man, um, what if I sit there and nothing, I can't do it? You know, what if I can't write anything, you know, better than the last one? Um, usually that's not the case. Usually, eventually, you crack through and you do it. But I guess I'm at that point right now where I'm thinking about a, a record, and then I'm trying to think, hmm, should it be uh, like more of a conceptual record? Um, with like an overarching theme or something like that, um, <laughs> or or would it be a collection of songs? You know, and, and and I feel like in a way with the sort of contemporary times that we live in, like when you have a a lot of times when you're throwing things to the media, they they want like what's the story here? You know, like give me a story so that I know how to write about it. This is what the journalist would say, right? So in that sense, you feel like okay, well, I better have a kind of a concept that'd be better. But there are songs. I was just listening to. Um, you know, Damien Gerardo talk about his songwriting process the other day. And it sounded to me like he just kind of writes, just keeps writing every day. Like, I don't know if it's as, as sort of calculated as like, I'm going to write a song about the environment, an album about the environment or something. It's just like, I'm writing a song today. And then tomorrow I'm writing another song. And then when he has a bunch of songs, he records them. And I think I've always been that way. And it's nice to know that you can still, you know, credibly work that way. Uh, I think both are legitimate approaches to, you know, writing songs, whether you're sort of thinking about a grander theme or just yeah. writing day by day. But, uh, you know, you, you start to sort of consider which is what's the best approach. And a lot of these questions come to mind. But I did I did most recently feel sort of uh, comforted by hearing what Damien Gerardo said about songwriting, that you don't have to necessarily take it on as like, uh, grandiose task, you know, you just kind of just keep doing it and just keep doing it day by day by day by day. Huh. I, I was writing names as, as I was listening to you. Uh, I wrote down Randy Newman because uh, he, I said, well, tell me about your songwriting process. And, he, and I love Randy Newman. And he said, yeah. uh, he said, I give myself a deadline. I do nothing until about a week before the deadline when I have to hand it off to the label. And then I force myself to go like crazy for five five days, five nights, uh, record the demos, and then and then hand them in. He said, I, I, "I sooner or later I've got to stop doing that." But that's how I write my songs. I mean, what does he do in the, the lead up time? I guess he, he, does, he does not. He doesn't doesn't do anything. He's a dad. He does what he what, what Randy you know, yeah. or he performs or whatever. But he's not writing. Mm-hmm. He's not thinking about writing because he has nothing. But then the panic sets in, and off he goes. Uh, I, I would I would kill to have talked to Harry Nielsen about how he mm-hmm. wrote his songs. Um, Lennon McCartney. I think we understand the process there. Dylan. My goodness. Still to mm-hmm. this day, uh, somebody like Van Morrison who just goes on and on and on. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and Leonard Cohen, who said, I, I said to him, uh, tell, uh, uh, we talked about songwriting, and he said, um, here's the deal. I just had a conversation with Dylan in, in New York City, and uh, I asked him how long it took him to write um, um, songs. He said, it took me three minutes to write Lay, Lady, Lay, just to write it down. <laughs> and, and he said, that's ridiculous. It took me eight years to write Suzanne. Yeah. Eight years to write Suzanne to finally get it so that he was going to do it. So I mean, it's it's yeah. an incredible journey of the yeah. the stories behind the songs. For example, first draft. Mm-hmm. I, I'm still. I think the line is in there is I'm still trying to write my play. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and then you introduce horns in there. I love the musicians in the studio with you and the and the tone mm-hmm. of the song. Tell me about first draft. Yeah, it was a song about it's a song about writing, <laughs> as you say, and it was based on a Lori Moore store a story. Um, if we're talking about the uh, sold short story thing again, that was another one that came from that. And she has a story, and I'm, I forget the title of it um, as we speak, but it was about an aspiring playwright uh, who's just uh, sorry, I should more so say a struggling playwright in New York um, who's breaks up with his girlfriend. You know, he's like this stubborn guy, he just wants to stay put in his crappy apartment working on his plays. And she's like, God, we got to get out of here. This place is a crap hole, you know? And, um, and then she moves out and he stays there and, and, um, you know, everything just keeps breaking. The plumbing keeps backing up and all the rest of it. So, and he keeps working on his play with this aspiration that he's going to become, uh, famous at some point, or he's going to be recognized for his work, which, you know, I suppose uh, all artists in their, in their, 
you know, if they're in the early stages of their career, certainly, um, I think kind of identify with that feeling of like, you know, got to keep, got to keep pushing and working at it or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's, that was kind of the, the seed for, uh, for that song. But, um, yeah, I, I you know, as, yeah. Do you, do you have to see the character in your head? Do you have to see a face? Um, I guess I do. I mean, I, I, I think I do. If I'm writing my own songs, I, I, I certainly do see images and pictures. Yeah. And I mean, that happens if I'm reading things, I suppose maybe that happens with all, with all, all of us who are, you know, if we're reading, we, we sort of, that's a great thing about reading as opposed to even like watching films is that, you, you know, your mind generates um, it's its own kind of image, which is going to be unique to all the individuals, right? Okay. So you have your own kind of film film score going on in your head, but I I definitely get images, and you know uh, I I can kind of see I can kind of see the apartment and imagine these uh, uh, diesel trucks that are parked outside. <laughs> this is what happens in the stories that these yep. diesel trucks park outside and let their engines run. Damn running. diesels, keep, yes. Yeah, keep the gasoline smells or the diesel smells keep coming up through this apartment through the apartment windows but uh he is not driven out of his apartment he is diligently staying there but yeah i can i can picture all of that in my head for sure yeah so many scenes to write this coffee stained paper curl it won't be this poor for long I'm tired of being last Lagging like a desperate dog Under the shaky moon Howling too Now the water keeps backing up Up through the sink and the tub so I'll call the landlord soon And if he don't come well Then I'll call the plumber The worst thing is the bed at night Like sleeping in a block of ice Cause everything was easier with you here Some days don't falter and they don't Sometimes it's hard to breathe Damn these trucks and their diesel engines I'm still trying to write my play Once I get the first draft done I'll be working on the second one Radio song. It can't yeah. just be about a song on the radio, but it is. What else is it? <laughs> Let me think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, here's oh, the, yeah, here's the thing. Here's what What's I love. Lo- here's what I love about that. I love the Ray Manzarek keyboard work in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, sort of Quasi door thingy. I uh, just well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Everybody loves that part of it. Yeah, it was, that, that is cool. With this song, I, I actually started with the seed for. Um, it wasn't a short story. It was writing, uh, trying to write something for somebody's wedding, which is. Uh, a, a task that I've been given sometimes. And actually in this case, I don't think he, my friend asked me to, I just wanted to write something and he got married in Mexico and I was working on a song idea before that. And I was, I was really down to the wire, you know, for talking about writing, writing songs really at the last minute I was, I was on the airplane uh, flying to, uh, to Mexico city and still hadn't really finished the song. I had some ideas and I was working on it, working on it. And, uh, um, and and in the end, I never actually. I, I did come out with a version of the song, uh, and I remember playing it to the guy who was sharing my hotel room with me, another groomsman, and he was like, "Yeah, it's good. Oh, I like it." But as I played it to, you know, as I, sometimes when you play a song and you you can tell it's not there, like I, I just it's just a gut thing for me. I know, like um, I'm like something's not right. Pieces aren't connecting. Is you know the, the the cylinders aren't firing completely here. So I was like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to play it. I know it's half, this is half baked. So I never played the song at the wedding. And then I, I came back and I um, continued to work on it. And I have so many different versions of that song. Um, and, and somewhere in there, I started, there was this idea about like music, uh, like music sort of songs that float around in the atmosphere. I've always kind of like this idea of radio waves. You know, here we are talking on the radio, but um, radio waves are sort of floating around so that if a song is got transmitted, it's somewhere still bouncing around out there in the world. And, yes. um, and so I, that sort of, that sort of idea started to come into the earlier versions of the song that I was creating. Uh, and I think the chorus was too long still, but I don't know, there was that element. I kind of kept going in there and I was like, I like that thing about this something about a signal that's bouncing around. You know? oh. And so I sort of pulled that out uh, and distilled it down and distilled it down. And I've got to a tighter chorus, which was, uh, it was really elaborate before I can't even remember it, but you know, the chorus now is like, let me be your radio, you know, yeah. uh, I, 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 I will be your radio and I'll transmit the signal. It sort of seemed like the simplest way to kind of articulate. Well done. Um, yeah. A, a kind of, emotion right and so that's in a way kind of shows a bit of the process to you go from this meandering complexity to something that says in a more simplistic way what you want to say and when i nailed that chorus i was like this is it this is it i caught it you know (laughs) this is radio song from the brand new album by Tarek. it's called telegrams into my view The same one I heard so long ago It plays through the flight In those cabin lines We cross the line of darkness into the morning Now the radio song Always coming in strong It helps me find my way back home to you I hear it outside my hotel Street and Saturday It goes across the alley Up through Trumpet Bell Let me Let me play your song while the signal's strong. 
I, I hope that your uh, students uh, in your classes appreciate uh, how lucky they are to cross paths with you. Very cool. Um, <laughs> and it all shows itself in the new album, Telegrams, uh, on Tonic Records. It's out now. Um, I w- will not be surprised if we see you show up uh, at another Juno program. Wonderful. Um, mm. Thank you for this. Uh, have yourself a great time. Uh, in Calgary and Edmonton, going back home, so to speak, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, and uh, and carry on teaching all of us how to appreciate songs, and um, I'm going to leave you with uh, "Walking Dead." Old love carries me around, takes me out on the town. Gets me drunk, gets me high Old love can't say goodbye Old love can't say goodbye Old love is always late so I always hang around and wait down the minutes on my cigarette in this parking lot when there's no one left to sing to. Oh, no one left to sing to. Oh, love, oh, love, I'm a wreck without you. People keep on asking what's new. Podcast in conversation with Tarek 
The name of his new album is Telegrams. It's on Tonic Records. It's out now. The first single was Kokohala. The second was Walking Dead. He's in Edmonton May the 24th at that side door concert. Next Saturday, May the 25th in Calgary at the King Eddie. And June the 7th in Weimar, B.C., the Tiny Lights Music Festival. You can also find him at UBC, obviously. Coming up on Mulligan's 2 Podcast, next week, our guest will be the enormously talented and brave Melissa Etheridge and her new album called The Medicine Show. June the 1st, we hope to have Jen Grant and her new music on the podcast. And June the 15th, Keb Mo and his new album called Oklahoma, featuring one of the great tracks that I've heard in quite some time called Put the Women in Charge. And a lost conversation, never been aired, with Solomon Burke. I did the interview a couple of months before he died. I just couldn't bring myself to run it. We're going to do it now. You can find the details for this show at mulliganstew.ca, where you'll also find Mulligan Stew Radio and Tasting Room Radio. And thank you for subscribing to Mulligan Stew, the podcast, on Spotify, Google Play, or Apple Podcasts. Much appreciated.